Brethren and sisters, when we talk about the key of the house of David, you, you'll notice in that chapter it says they will bear it on their shoulder. Now the custom in those days was that when they, the king went to celebrate in the temple the glory of Yahweh and so forth and speak on behalf of the people, he, he, he was preceded by a man, a tre always the treasurer, carrying this huge key to unlock all the doors as they went up from the house of the forest of Lebanon up to the place of worship. And that was what was known as the key of the house of David. Now there's no doubt about it, brothers and sisters, but this is all about the Lord Jesus Christ because he's got the key of the house of David. This is what that said, doesn't it? So the angel of the, of the church or in the ecclesia I've got there, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. And if we're wondering what he's opening and shutting, well, it's the grave. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and death. And we can imagine, brothers and sisters, in that glorious day when he comes, it'll certainly be a great procession. And won't it be a wonderful thing that that key will unlock the graves of many of our brothers and sisters who lay asleep waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just a brief historical setting of this chapter. What's happening, brothers and sisters, is quite alarming. There's quite an alarming situation here, and panic, panic is now streaking right through the nation, right through the world, as a matter of fact, because Assyria is on the march. And Assyria, brothers and sisters, without a shadow of a doubt, <clears throat> was not only one of the most powerful nations of, of our ancient empires, but it was by far and away the most brutal and cruel of all people. They were the Nazis of that generation. Everybody, Nahum makes that mention, that the whole world trembled when Assyria was on the march, and she's certainly on the march now. And the time is around about the time of Ahaz, who's the father of Hezekiah, and of course of Hezekiah who followed him. That's the time of this, this setting of this chapter. And what's happening is this, that he's coming into the Middle East, everyone's given up hope, and everyone's panic-stricken, right? So you got up in the northern kingdom there, you've got the king of Israel up there, Pekah, he's making a deal with the Syrians, not the Assyrians, but the Syrians who were immediately north of him. And, it, and Judah down in the south was saying, hey, what are you doing? You're forming a confederacy against us. And people are getting confused as to what was going on, the Assyrian, of course, was crushing people as he came. The nations were all in the turmoil. These two nations, smaller nations up there, are trying to get, a, uh, get together to oppose him. Judah is wondering what in the heck's going on. And what do the people do? They just said, ah, it's useless. And everybody went their own way and they said, right, let's have a party. Let's drink and dance and be merry. That was the scene, brothers and sisters, of Isaiah 22. People had abandoned hope. It was all so useless and they just had gone their own way and said, we've had it, forget it, let's enjoy ourselves while we can. That was the scene and you can just imagine that won't be very long, before that'll be the same scene that'll overtake this world in which we live. Now Shebna and Eliakim are featured in this chapter and you'll notice, brothers and sisters, that both of them were mentioned in the reigns of Ahaz and Hezekiah. And here in Ahaz we read, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh of armies, Go get thee unto this treasurer. There are treasures of men that carry that key. Even unto Shebna, which is over the house. And of course at that time, that man Shebna, his name means to grow, to grow, and he certainly he wanted to grow. He, he had his head as almost as big as the temple. He, he was a very ambitious man very self-opinionated man. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. So there we find in the days of Ahaz, the, the father of, of Hezekiah, that Shebna has got the key and Eliakim is just a mere servant. But when we come to the reign of Hezekiah and he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, things are reversed and Shebna's a scribe. He just takes notes. So Hezekiah had overturned the arrangements between the two of them and now Eliakim's over the household and the, and the Shebna's the scribe 
and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth, the, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, they came to Hezekiah about this grim thing that was happening uh, with, of course, the kingdom of Assyria now blackening the whole of the Middle East in, in terror, brothers and sisters, absolute terror. Now, the divisions of this chapter then, how do they go? Well, you've got verses 1 to 7. There's a defeatist attitude of pleasure seekers. They've all given up and they're eating and drinking while they can. That, that's the sum total of it. From verses 8 to 14, the prophet surveys their me the defence measures. He's having a look at their defence measures to see what they're trying to do. Then you've got verses 5 to 19, you have here the indictment of Shebna and the, the, the ruler of the house. And then we got from verse 20 to 24, the future elevation and glory of Eliakim. And finally, there's a restatement at the end of Shebna's downfall. So the first thing we read, brothers and sisters, in verse 1 is the burden of the valley of, of vision. Valley of vision? Look at verse uh, 5. It's a day of trouble, treading down, perplexity by the Lord Yahweh of hosts in the valley of vision. Brothers and sisters, if you want to see a vision, you don't stand in a valley. That's the whole point of that expression. That was the attitude. That lost the vision. If you want to see a vision, you get on top of a hill. But they were in a valley. And where there is no vision, the people will perish. Where there's no vision, the people will perish. We, we've got to have a vision, brothers and sisters. And if ever there was a need of a vision, it's today. And it, it shouldn't be hard to create a vision of the circumstances which will accompany the Lord Jesus Christ coming. A massive earthquake. The, absolute, the world is absolutely wrecked. Every wall has fallen to the ground. People are running around looking for their iPads and their iPhones and all everything else, and they don't work. And the whole world is in chaos. And Jesus Christ is coming. And he's here. And our vision can see beyond that, brothers and sisters, of the glory of the age in which he will set up. And the government will be upon his shoulder. There'll be no idiots in Parliament. It's not hard to create a vision. The worse the situation comes, the better the vision should be. And we should not say to ourselves, well, let's go off the holidaying and all of it, because who cares, because it's all over. We mustn't have that attitude that they have. We've got a better future. In the visions of God, he brought me to the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain. Ezekiel did not have a valley of vision. He had a mountain upon which to see it, brothers and sisters. And he saw this frame of the city on the south. And he brought me hither, and behold, there was a man who was the appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line and a flax in his hand, and a measuring reed, and he stood at the gate. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold but with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, and let thine heart be on all that I will show thee to the intent that I might show thee that thou art brought hither, to declare that thou was what thou seest to, to the house of Israel. And that man went around, brothers and sisters, building the temple while Ezekiel watched him and finished up in the most holy place with that man in that vision. And Yahweh said, Son of man, the place of the soles of my feet. And the record says, And that man stood by me. Wow. Imagine Ezekiel looking at him and saying, Wow. Yahweh, the place of the soles of my feet. Who's he? He is the manifestation of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, the manifestation of Yahweh. Ezekiel didn't know that. They got into the most holy place. And Yahweh said, Ezekiel, I'm standing here with you. And that was the great vision. You don't see that in valleys. You do not see that in valleys. Now look what they were doing. They're wholly gone up to the housetops. Now they were having parties up there. Now, brothers and sisters, in Israel... When you have made a house, you, you, you didn't, uh, the design of that house was get, prepared be, not by you, but by Yahweh. When thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, 
that thou bring not blood upon that house if any man fall from thence. So they had to have a rooftop with a, 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 a battlement or a guardrail around it just in case they fell off. And we learn from the New Testament and other places, they also had to make an outside staircase by which you could reach the top of that house without going inside. Let him that's upon the, uh, in, in the, in the house, go not into the house and up to the housetop, says the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need reason that you could not design that, brothers and sisters, the reason it was designed for you because Every day the priest went into the holy place and saw the design of that tabernacle, of that house. All your houses was designed on the basis of the altar of incense. He shall overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about and the horns thereof and thou shalt make it a crown of gold round about. In the Hebrew, top and sides are, are really margin roof and walls and the altar of incense had a flat top had a little guardrail on the outside and in the middle of that was the bowl of incense smoking away morning till evening and evening till morning prayer night day all through the night and all through the day and so brothers and sisters God was telling them that your houses should be a house of prayer so Peter went up on the house top to pray. That was the purpose of, that, of the top of the house. He went up there to pray. Other men did that. David made a mistake. He went up the house top one day with an empty mind and he was drawn away with lust. But forget about that. That wasn't the purpose of the house. The purpose of the house was to pray. What are these people doing? They're going to have a party. They're going up there, brothers and sisters, to have a party. They're going up there for a party. And in verse 2, it says that they were a tumultuous city. They were a tumultuous city. The word means clamorous, to rage. To rage in a, in a tumultuous party. People going absolutely crazy with all these things. And then he says in verse 2, they're not slain with the sword, nor are they dead in battle. It's a defeatist attitude, brothers and sisters. In other words, they were dead. They'd given up. They'd given up. And back in chapter 8, which is related to this chapter, Yahweh spoke to me with a strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, do not call conspiracy everything that these poor people call it conspiracy. And of course, the conspiracy they're worried about is Syria and Israel. Have you heard the news? What, what news? Israel's gone and made a pact with Syria. You're joking. Wow. You, well, that's, if the Assyrian wasn't enough, this is our own people. For goodness sake, what's happening? So there was this talk about conspiracy. Do not call conspiracy everything that the, the other people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread it. Yahweh Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And he will be your sanctuary. But for both the house of Israel will he be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes men th them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. And that's what Jesus said, didn't he? Whoever falls upon this stone will be broken, and upon whom it falls, it will grind him in pieces, he said. And here they were, brothers and sisters, he said, if you want to fear someone, fear God. And that's a very good thing, brothers and sisters. You know, people talk about... You know, every time this is mentioned, oh, people say, it doesn't really mean be frightened. It means, or oh, rubbish. It means fear God. That's what it means. And I fear God, don't you? Fear God, brothers and sisters. Our destiny is in his hands. Think of that. That's what he said. You don't worry about the Assyrian. You've got bigger problems here with God. If, if you can't handle that, the Assyrian, don't worry about, about that. It's one God's the one that you've got to worry about, brothers and sisters. And then we read this in verse 3. It says, all the rulers have fled together. They are bound by the archers. Well, you, you see, brothers and sisters, that in the margin it says, bow. They haven't got the arrows. See, in effect, not, it's not saying they were completely disarmed. It's, it's saying their attitude, they had no resistance to this. There, there was no resistance. There, there was nobody capable or, or willing to, to even worry about it. 
And then the prophet, he sees what's going on. I will weep bitterly. I will weep bitterly. And you can remember, brothers and sisters, as the Jesus wrote into the city of Jerusalem for the last time on the colt, the foal of an ass. And he topped the rise of Olivet. You know, to the uh, southern end of it, you go around to sort of a rise. Olivet, the peak's up higher, but you go over this bend like that. And this, I've been there and you've seen this. You go up over the bend. You, and as you go up top over that way, Jerusalem lays at your feet across the valley of the Kid. When it's down there, you see the whole panorama of it comes into view just as you top that rise. And he got there and he did what Ezekiel did, he, or rather Isaiah did, he burst into tears. If only you knew, he said, the things that belong unto your peace, but they're hid from your eyes. And he wasn't talking about peace as cessation from war. He was talking about the peace of God, of which Jerusalem, of course, is a symbol. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, and then king of peace. That's Jerusalem. If only you'd known that. And brothers and sisters, if only the brethren and sisters today knew that. Today, first king of righteousness, and after that, king of peace. That was the, that, what that city stood for. But these people here, no, no, no. They, they haven't, even, haven't even got any, 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 any resolve in them, even to try and save that city. And the prophet weeps over it. And then he says in verse 5, it's a day of trouble. It's a day of trouble, brethren and sisters. And that day of trouble came to a climax in the days of Hezekiah. Here's Hezekiah's reaction to the day of trouble. This man's different. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of Yahweh. And he said, Eliakim, the palace administrator, shepherd of the secretary and the leading priest, all wearing sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says. This is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace, as when children come to the point of birth and there is no strength to deliver us, to deliver them. That's from the NIV because it's a bit clear of it. The authorised does actually use the expression, this is the day of trouble. What does he do? Throw a party? Go on a holiday? Abandon all hope? No, no, no. He faces the reality, brothers and sisters. Go and find out what Yahweh wants us to do and what's necessary. That's the way to handle problems, brothers and sisters. Don't go around panicking and throwing your hands in the air. Just say, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? That's the important thing. And you know, brothers and sisters, some of, the, some of the most serious problems have got the most simplest answers. It's all in here. And we run around and do this and do that. And the Bible is very clear. But people will want to try and do something to add their own strength to what they think they can move mountains. Well, they can't, but God can. And Hezekiah knew that. That was a different reaction than everybody else in that land. That's how he reacted to this matter. Now in verse 6, in verse 5 it says, It's a day of trouble, treading down of perplexity by the Lord Yahweh of armies in the valley of vision, breaking down walls and crying to the mountains. Crying to the mountains. They're crying to the mountains. A voice on the bare heights is heard. The weeping and pleading of Israel's sons because they have perverted their way. They have forgotten Yahweh their God. Return, O faithless sons, I will heal your faithlessness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the, the Yahweh our God. Truly the hills are a delusion. The orgies on the mountains, truly Yahweh our God is the salvation of Israel. Now that's not in the days of Hezekiah. That's in a later history, right at the end of Judah's commonwealth. But the hills are a delusion. Why? Because they were having orgies on the mountain. Sensual parties. So that Judah was doing this when the Babylonians threatened them. But that's not what the mountains were made for, brothers and sisters. Crying to the mountains for help will get them nowhere. I will lift up mine eyes out of the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from Yahweh, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. 
He that keepeth thee will not slumber. So here the psalmist sees you go up at the hill. You think, oh, this is a good vantage point. I can, I can resist the enemy here. I've got, I've got a distinct advantage in the type of warfare they fought. But then he stops. He says, no, no. The heavens and the earth, that's where my advantage is. Look at all the vantage points involved in that. That belongs to Yahweh. And he, he can keep our feet. We won't trip up. And that was his attitude, brothers and sisters. Crying to the mountains. Let me get down to verse 6 of this chapter. We read about Elam, which bear the quiver, and Kerbal, which uncovered the shield. In actual fact, brothers and sisters, they were the northeast and the southwest extremity of the, of the Assyrian Empire. So in other words, news is coming that the whole, the whole empire, actually of that area of Assyria, is now being armed. They're rearmed and they're coming, brothers and sisters. That's the message. They're coming. And then in verse 7 he says, It shall come to pass that the choicest valley shall be full of chariots, and horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. The choicest valleys. The place which they marked out for their orgies. And they're, and they're partying and they're carrying on. Well, they're not going to be filled, brothers and sisters, with bowls of wine and plenty of food and all sorts of sensual delights, there's going to be chariots in that valley. They're going to see war. They're going to see tough times, brothers and sisters. It's coming. This is what we're being told here. Then in verse 8, And he discovered the covering of Judah. So Judah hasn't got much to defend themselves. And thou didst look in that day to the armour of the house of the forest. Now that's interesting. The house of the forest of Lebanon. Now there it is. Now just this is what Solomon had built, brothers and sisters. But Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished all his house. He built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. The length thereof was 100 cubits and the breadth thereof 50 cubits and the height thereof 30 cubits upon four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams upon the pillars. And it was covered with cedar above upon the beams that lay on the 45 pillars, 15 in a row. And there were windows in three rows and light was, uh, was against light in three ranks. Now let me, let me just paint that picture for you. I've looked up these Hebrew terms, brothers and sisters, they're not hard to find out. You see that house of, was, was leading up to the royal throne. It was through there that they all had to go in procession. And those, those cedar beams, those, those trees, 45 of them, cedars, brothers and sisters, these magnificent cedars, standing these great columns, 15 in a row, and they were polished, polished beautifully, so that the, the grain stood out. And what Solomon had done, he'd put on either side of the wall narrow windows, which slanted the sun into that place. And then he hung on the wall, brothers and sisters, 500 shields. So when the king went into that place, he would stand there at the door and the guards would go forward, 500 of them. They'd walk around the hall in, in, a, in, 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 of course, in, in the proper manner. They just wouldn't amble around. They'd march around there. Each one would pull a shield down. He'd cover his body with it. They would form three ranks and the king would go through the middle. They would be on the other side of him and fronted before him. And as they went down there, the light would shine in. It would flash on the shields and flash! In the cedar pillars. It would just flash. And there would be flashes, 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 flashes. As the, as the troops went down that aisle with these golden shields, brothers and sisters. And when the queen of Sheba, Sheba saw that, she went, oh, took a breath away. And they were now looking at that place as a place of armament. But you see, there wasn't much left. For after Solomon... Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of Yahweh and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass. And that's how the kingdoms go, don't they, brothers and sisters? From gold to brass. And that's because of stupidity. 
because this young upstart, when he became the heir to the throne, he thought he could rule in his own right, and he just spurned the the the, the uh, wisdom of the old men around him. He said, "Ah, I, I'm, I know all about this," and brought the nation to absolute ruin. And so the gold become brass, brothers and sisters. And then we read this in verse nine. You've seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many, and gathered together the waters of the lower pool. Now, isn't that interesting? To gather together the waters of the lower pool. Now, this, I believe, is before Hezekiah. Hezekiah did it properly. And the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And you know, brothers and sisters, they all knew about that spring, the spring of Gihon, up at the towards the northern end of the of the valley of the Kidron, hard up in on the on the flank of that valley, there was a perennial stream under there. They run in funny places, you know, perennial streams. Ask Keith Gore, he knows about it. And this one was the same, it was halfway up the slope. It was just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And these people were wondering whether they could do something about this. Well, they didn't do anything about it, but Hezekiah did. And, Hez and, the, and the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might, and he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city. And Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which Yahweh has spoken concerning him, the virgin." The daughter of Zion has despised you. Oh, I love that, brothers and sisters. I love that. You see, that was the spring of Gihon. Gihon means to bring forth. To bring forth. And Yahweh tells Hezekiah, that's like my purpose. Your father didn't want this message. I offered him this and he rejected it. When he was panic-stricken, he told him, a virgin will conceive. I'll give you a sign. A virgin will conceive. He said, I don't want signs. I don't need signs. But the sign has come, brothers and sisters. It came, of course, eventually in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Did we need it? Do we need him? Goodness gracious me. We're desperate, brothers and sisters. We desperately need that man. What other defense have we got against this world? Or anything else for that matter? The virgin daughter of Zion has despised you and laughed thee to scorn. You imagine Rab Shaker. Just imagine what sort of a general he was when he stood outside the walls, when, when he surrounded it in Hezekiah's day, brothers and sisters. Imagine this hardened crim, this, this hardened soldier, brutal and, and absolutely fierce, not a, not a drop of, of pity in his blood, brothers and sisters, hard as nails. And Eliakim fronts him up and says, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem laughs at you, a little girl. You think of that. Sin is a monster, crushing life out of millions of people. Voracious brothers and sisters, consuming all in its path. Little boy laying in a manger, born of a virgin. That's God's answer. But Ahaz didn't want that. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Again, whom have thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? So this was the sign. And this is what Hezekiah did, didn't he? Hezekiah's tunnel. You see, with that water all running down there, following that line? Well, that's where Hezekiah's tunnel is. The Gihon Spring, up at the northern end of the valley of the Kidron, comes down to the king's garden, says Nehemiah 3.15, 540 metres, brothers and sisters, underground, dug from one end to the other, and they met in the middle, and there was the plaque in the middle of the way that tunnel was dug, and I think it's in Turkey now somewhere, I'm told, and that plaque, you can go today and see that very plaque that was taken out of that tunnel in the days of Hezekiah, and they brought that down there. And in the Song of Solomon, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. And that fountain, brothers and sisters, became a symbol of married life, 
Oh yes, certainly it was a prophecy of a virgin who would have a child before she was married, of course. We know that. But it also became a symbol, brothers and sisters, of what happens when people get married. A man marries a girl. He closes up all other avenues to that fountain other than himself. That is his, his refreshment in life is that woman. That's what Solomon said. Now this is from the RSV because the, the authorised version says it in the opposite. It's wrong. Drink waters from your own cistern. Flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad? Streams of water in the streets? No. Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. So you see what Yahweh was telling Hezekiah? It was all a wonderful figure of speech, brothers and sisters, of how a man takes a maiden and he loves her and she loves him. They agree to get married. They're one, one unit, aren't they, when they get married. She doesn't belong to anybody else. You don't invite strangers into that house that would try and woo her away from you. That's your woman. You, you go and you block that up. You make certain... That, that that fountain is blocked from all other angles. It only runs in one direction, into your well, into the king's garden. It became a marvellous symbol, brothers and sisters. A marvellous symbol. And you know, the it says, he that fashioned it long ago. You see, he told the people, you're running around looking at this well, and you're thinking, what are we going to do with, it, do with this? And they're all making plans. Of course, Hezekiah finished up making the best plan. But until then, they were getting all sorts of ideas, weren't they? And the prophet says to them in, in, this, in this verse in Isaiah 22, he says, haven't you ever thought about the one who made that water that gave you that water there? It's an unusual thing, isn't it, to see a spring up there, actually on the side of a hill, and it's very copious and never, never runs out. He said, you ever thought about that? Well, you people running around thinking what you could do, who did that? You know, you, you read these verses, verses from Isaiah. For as much as the people refuses the waters of Shiloh that goes softly, that goes softly. The word means a little underground stream running down there that you know, no one knows it's there. Hezekiah hid it. He hid the thing. And then he brought it under the wall so they couldn't see where it was going. And it was running under there. And, but see, this is what, what his father Ahaz didn't want. He said, you refuse that. The waters of Shiloh that goes softly and and you rejoice in Rezin and Remaliah's son, that is Assyria and, 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 sorry, Syria and Israel up in the north. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon you the waters of a river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. Look at, the, look at the difference, brothers and sisters. So you want a water supply. Well, what the prophet says, you ever thought about him that fashioned it? What did he fashion for you? What did he make for you? Did he bring you a thumping big flood that bashed down the walls of Jerusalem and washed all your houses down the valley of the Hinnom and off down to the south? Did he do that? Did you find storms sweeping through you, creating havoc among all your crops and everything? No. you got this little stream that runs softly and no one can see it but you. And if you reject that, look out for the flood. And the Assyrian brothers and sisters came through that land like a flood and inundated Emmanuel's land, drowned it, because the people did not see that beneath all that there was an underground stream that Yahweh had put there years ago. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Consider this, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. Isn't that interesting? And the word river again is a, a little soft stream. There is a river in the city of God. 
There's all these blind men at the pool of Bethesda. Big pool. See it all. It's all there. And a poor fellow, 38 years there, can't get in. And many others wouldn't have got in either at the time appointed. And they're all there in their dismal way, brothers and sisters, moaning and bemoaning their fate. And Jesus comes to that man and sends him down to the bottom of the city to the pool of Siloam where Hezekiah's tunnel finished. There was only a little pool down there. But he came back with his eyesight. And that's the position, the, the, the picture rather, that's being, that's being painted here. That's being painted here, brothers and sisters. Now in verse 12, he says here, And in that day, the Lord Yahweh of hosts called to weeping, to mourning, to boldness, and girding with sacrifice. Right? So it's, it's not a place now, brothers and sisters, to having your wild parties. You ought to be mourning. This ought, ought to be a serious matter. People should wake up with themselves. Forget about their pleasures. Forget about tearing here and there and all over the place. Forget about doing this or doing that or building this or building that. The time has come, brothers and sisters, for solid, solemn thinking and planning as to our, our very near future, which is not here on this earth in the condition that it is today. It's on this earth in a different, vastly different condition. And we've got to have that very, very clearly, very clearly fixed in our minds, brothers and sisters. So this is what was happening in the days of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Hezekiah. And then we read this in verses 13 and 14. But instead of that, instead of soberness, mourning, instead of, you know, a bit of humility, no, behold, joy and gladness, verse 13, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, drinking wine, wine, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. That's a serious matter, brothers and sisters. Here's how serious it is. For tomorrow we shall die. That's in the New Testament. Did you know that? You do, of course you know it. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's straight from that chapter, isn't it? Straight from that chapter. And here's a warning to the Corinthians. For tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, the next verse says. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Evil associations, brothers and sisters, lead to bad morals. That's what Paul says. And the prophet goes on to say that they're going to die, aren't they? See? And he says, your iniquity is not purged. You, your iniquity, he says in the next verse, surely this iniquity shall not be purged. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Their iniquity is not purged. Jesus Christ died, brothers and sisters, first to declare God right. And when he raised him from the dead, brothers and sisters, it was because the peace of, could come upon mankind in, emer, in eternal life in the kingdom of God. But if you're going to run around having a great time ignoring the warnings that are all about us, brothers and sisters, then that's going to be our fate. That's why Paul takes the exact expression out of Isaiah 22 to make his point in a chapter that we all know, brothers and sisters, as being the most powerful chapter in the whole of the Bible on resurrection. Well, of course, we come to verses 15 and 19, and now we've got this fella, we've got this fella Shebna. He's the treasurer, we read in verse 15. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh of hosts, go and get thee under this treasurer. Notice the contemptuous remark, this treasurer. In other words, it's going to be a very temporary position for him to hold. Even under Shebna, which is over the house, and say to him here. And then he points out, well, what do you got here? What, what, what's he got? Well, he's got a, he's got a, 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 he got a, a, a grave hewn out of a rock. So this fellow... Well, he's, he's, he's got ambitions, hasn't he? 
even in death, he's got ambitions. Because when all else is, you know, everybody else has just flung down to the valleys for the carrion to pick or, and left the rot, perhaps, and, and so forth, or buried in, in piles. Oh, no, no, no. The, he will have a secret little cave. And that'll be Shebna's cave. And it'll, all, it'll be known by posterity. Shebna really, historically, survived. Yahweh says, no, no. Go and I've got a message for him. This Jebna, brothers and sisters, was the epitome of all that was wrong with that people. And Yahweh's got a message for him. You go and tell him. You go and tell him. And here's the message. Behold, the Lord will hurl you away violently, O you strong man. He will seize firm hold of you and will whirl you around and around and throw you like a ball into a wide land. There shall you die, and there shall your splendid shall be your splendid chariots, you shame of your father's house. So away he went, brothers and sisters. Imagine Yahweh picks him up and wraps him up into a nice round ball and goes, whoosh! And I reckon Yahweh's hand would throw pretty far, don't you? I reckon that, that hand would have a pretty good throwing hand. And he's gone off into eternity. And that's what happens, brothers and sisters, to ambition. He's gone off into eternity. That's the end of him. That's the end of Shebda. And he, he says in verse 19, And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And that's why we find that in the days of Hezekiah, we find Eliakim is now over the house. And this chap's just a little secondary, taking notes. So the roles have been reversed, brothers and sisters. And then we come, brothers and sisters, to this, at this next one when he says, from verses 20 to 24, the future glory of Eliakim. And he says in verse 20, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will call my servant. He will say, in effect, what Isaiah 42 says. Behold my servant. Oh yes, he's got, he's got God's servant, a slave, but on the earth in that temple, he's now going to be ruler of the whole house. He's going to be the supervisor of the house of David, the treasurer. He's going to have all the finance at his fingertips, but he's just a servant. But he's a wonderful servant, brothers and sisters. And Eliakim means whom God will set up, whom God, brothers and sisters, will set up. That's this man called Eliakim. I will, and then he says in verse 21, I will clothe him with thy girdle. That's the only other occurrence of the eight times it's rendered, or one of the eight times it's rendered for the priest's garments, brothers and sisters. You see, that, that speaks of Jesus Christ. He's got, the, he's got the king of the house of David. He's going to be clothed with immortality. I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride decketh, adorneth herself with her jewels. Wonderful, brothers and sisters. You know, you need visions? You hardly need a mountain, do you? He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Now, you know, the older you get, the more you appreciate that. And I'm in that category now, and I, I can speak with, with some authority about this because I've got aches and pains all over my body. I've got a bad ankle. I've got a, a rump here. It's sore because I fell over the other day again for the second time. I've got all sorts of... I, I know all about that. And we, all of us, I know young and old do, but the older people more so, brothers and sisters, yearn for that day when you're clothed with immortality. Just can you imagine it? Renewing your strength. Like the eagle, feathers fall out, it, 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 it comes forth with a new coat of feathers. You rise up, you can walk without fainting, run, of course, without getting weary, brothers and sisters. This is the day we're looking for. Clothed with immortality. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like the Son of Man clothed with a long robe, 
and a girdle about his breast and so forth. So that's the man, brothers and sisters, that we're looking to solve the world's and our problems. And the end of verse 21 says this, He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. We dealt with that, of course, in one of the earlier studies on the highlights from Isaiah. You know, it says the, the, the everlasting father he's called in chapter 9. And we made reference to that one there that He's the father in the sense, brothers and sisters, that he represents the father to us. So Paul says that he could say, I am the children, the children whom God hath given me. You know, there used to be a custom when I first come into the truth, and, and even then, with a very sketchy knowledge of the truth I had at that stage, there was a phrase which was common to use in prayers. Thank goodness it's, it's dropped out of use, but I used, to, I used to send a shiver through my spine. When the brethren used to pray in the name of our elder brother. Now I know that we're brethren of Christ. And I know there's a certain way I suppose that could be understood like that. But it never ever rested softly with me. I, I felt uncomfortable with that. No, I and the children who God hath given me. He will represent fatherhood to us brothers and sisters. Very much so. But we've got to remember that. Uh, this is with a reference here where I believe that comes from in Hebrews. A father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's the day, brothers and sisters, that we're all looking for. Now then, let's have a look here. Now in verse 22, of course, we read about the key upon his shoulder. And then we read again in verse 23, we read this. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious front throne to his father's house. Now, a nail in a sure place. Now, it, the Hebrew word signifies a peg. And I understand from what I read about the, the ancient methods in those days, is what they used to do in order to, to put uh, uh, pl places to hang garments and vessels, utensils for the kitchen and so forth, all around the house in these mud houses that many of them had, what they did was to get a, a, a root of a tree dig up a root of a tree and cut up a small part of that where there was one prominence part and there'd be other roots coming out from the bottom. So there'd be a, have a thing coming down like that and then several points going like that. And they would dig a hole in the wall and they would put that, the, the roots in there and they'd pack that and plaster it up and let it go as hard so you couldn't get that peg out. So you see, it's got a very great connotation. It's not just simply hammering it in with nails or putting it with screws. This is a work of art. You dig a hole, you get the right sort of root, you put the, the end in that splays out in all directions, you plast that end and leave the other point sticking out to hang your clothes or whatever you want else on. It was a real art. And he's going to be a nail in a sure place. Shepner's going to be, thought he was going to be like that in that cave, but he's, he's, got, he's still rolling through the world. He's been hung to eternity, flung to eternity. Zechariah says, out of him came forth the corner, out of him the nail. Same word. Out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. So Zechariah makes mention of that. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from Yahweh our God, says Ezra, to leave us a remnant and to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us little reviving in our bondage. Same word. So there's your word for nail or for peg. And you see, you can understand that when it says in a sure place, well, you know, you get, as we would today, you get pretty hard timber and you screw the screws in an inch or so. You, you can understand that being sure. But you see, this is, there's added point to this, the way it had to be done. It was a work of art. Dig a hole, the right size. Get the roots in there, plaster in. Make sure the plaster's mixed properly. Make sure it hardens right. Make sure it won't move. It's all a work of art, brothers and sisters. It's a work of Almighty God. And then it goes on to say in verse 24, And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issues, all vessels of small quantity, from vessels of cups even to vessels and flagons. Now this is interesting. Paul says, 
But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. Now here you see Paul saying that in this great house, all these vessels would be hanging on those nails, or pegs as we should call them, and some of those vessels would be valuable, others wouldn't. Some would be to honour and some to dishonour. Paul's telling Timothy to make sure that he purges his life to become a decent vessel for use in God's house. You don't have a sauce but that leaks in your house, do you? You wouldn't put it on the stove if it leaked out the bottom all over everything. You'd throw it out. You'd get one that didn't leak. And that's what Paul's telling him. All these vessels that, that are used in households. But you see, that's what Paul said. But look at this. Here's the translation of the Hebrew words here we used in that verse. Offspring, earth shoots, Dr. Thomas calls them, and that's what, they, that's what the Hebrew actually means. That's Brother Thomas's translation of offspring. Issue, Hebrew means an outcast thing. Small is least or youngest. Cups is a hollow basin. And flagons are from a root word meaning fading or vile. Nothing honourable about a lot of them, is there? That's not the point. You see, brothers and sisters, that's not the point. Because God has a house and it's all over the world. We're part of that house. But we don't have too many outstanding personalities in the world's eyes here, do we? And that's the point he's making. You see, he's making this point. For you see, you're calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? Why? that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, brothers and sisters, we have a cursed doctrine floating around in our brotherhood entitled theistic evolution. And the people who are parading that around as fact that evolution is true, it's just the way that God used it, People that are parading around that as fact in their writings. I've, not, I've seen some have printed out. I haven't got the net. I'm, thank goodness I've got that. But I see the things that have come off of it. They are saying that we wouldn't expect, we would not expect our ordinary brothers and sisters to understand that because they're not educated at that point. Thank God they're not educated at that point. They are the foolish people of this world. They are the stupid people, the simple people, and God loves them. You know why? Because they take him at his word. But Paul says at the end of Romans 1, this is at the end of Corinthians 1, he says this, brothers and sisters, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image of a beast, a four-footed beast. That's exactly what they do. And they are fools. They are real fools. These people are wise people. But they're not seen by the world as that. They're not seen as by the world as that, brothers and sisters. They've never been cursed with a scientific education. All right, science is valuable. I understand that. I appreciate that. But when it runs riot into this area and treads upon holy ground, brothers and sisters, it is fool foolish. It is absolutely foolish. And the sooner and the better we get rid of that, the better for everyone concerned, brothers and sisters. And finally, the verse says, In that day, saith Yahweh of armies, shall the nail that is fastened in a sure place be removed and cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for Yahweh hath spoken it. And I, you see, that's, some people find that difficult. They say, hang on, now look, 
he's been talking about this nail in the short place, and we've just seen the connotation of all that and the meaning of it. Now we see it doesn't fit. And some say, well, that's a reference, you know, to the, the crucifixion of Christ. I don't think it is. It may be. I, I just, but I don't, in my opinion, I don't think it is. I think that's a restatement of Shebna's position. He had a nail in a short place, he thought. He thought that hole in the rock, you know, was sealed up. No one could ever get in there. But Yahweh did. And he will remove that, brothers and sisters. But we're waiting for the day, of course, when the real, the real nail will be fastened. It's already been fastened in. The virgin birth did that. Fastened him in, didn't it, brothers and sisters? And he came through with flying colours and now sits at the right hand of the power and the majesty on high. And God said to him, Son... All power in heaven and earth I give to you. Think of that. All power in heaven and in earth is given to him. That's a nail, brothers and sisters. That's cemented in and no one will ever, ever pull that out. And Jesus will come, brothers and sisters, to hang in glory in God's house. All those people, earth shoots, with all their human weaknesses, with all their no notoriety about them, humble folk, they'll hang there in glory, fixed in to the temple walls, as it were in a figure, never to be removed by anybody. That, brothers and sisters, is an amazing thing. We can't wait until Jesus comes to exercise that key in the graves of our loved ones now lying there, waiting for his return, to unlock those graves, and for those of us who may be alive and remain at his coming, to join them in that glorious day when no power on earth, brothers and sisters, will ever threaten us again.